is the you're emeritus something, aren't you? Nope. He he is a distinguished professor, definitely at not no, you're not distinguished yet? Okay. Well you are in our eyes. Um He's a, he's a Greek New Testament professor at uh, Master's Seminary, and uh, Dr. Thomas has done the two-volume commentary on Revelation. That is the most extensive uh, commentary uh, available from the futurist perspective. And I know I'm teaching Daniel and Revelation at Liberty next semester, and I'm requiring them to get both volumes. And... Uh, <laughs> Also, Dr. Thomas has just done a lot of work. Uh, for example, the New American Standard um, Concordance uh, was something that he put together. And he is also a person who's engaged in interacting with the contemporary trends, which is uh, uh, from a dispensational perspective. And his book on Evangelical hermeneutics, the old versus the new, I highly recommend. If you want to know what happened hermeneutically uh, in the last 25 years while Rip Van Winkle was sleeping and he woke up and there was a whole different hermeneutical world out there, uh, Dr. Thomas traces the, uh, the shift and the impact of postmodernism and all this uh, mysticism and how hermeneutics has shifted and how it has impacted different fields of studies, like eschatology, like uh, the study of what the Bible teaches about the role of women and all kinds of other things. And so that's why we thought of him when we wanted someone to explain postmodern hermeneutics and Bible prophecy. And so we're happy for you, Dr. Thomas to come at this time and give us a presentation. Thank you very much. For those who may be having trouble understanding postmodernism and deconstruction, I have a Los Angeles Times article from January 3, 1999, entitled The Deconstruction of Clinton. <laughs> In 1999, the ostensible resort for President Clinton's impeachment is alleged perjury and obstruction of justice the real issue, however, may be his embrace of his embrace of deconstruction in America, in modern America. Uh, things like, uh, what does it mean to be alone? What what does is mean? All kinds of things. Well, the I am not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but it takes no prophet to predict what has happened in recent evangelicalism when the prevailing new evangelical hermeneutical procedures are implemented. I recently wrote new chapters of this book will be necessary as new doctrinal systems emerge from innovative opinions about what people think the Bible should say. The new hermeneutics provide no stopping points to limit the extremes to which individual personal inclinations may go in fostering new teachings allegedly derived from scripture. Predicting what, the new, what new system of doctrine will arise next is beyond one's wildest, wildest imagination. Today's systems of hermeneutics offer no controls on personal preferences with the new hermeneutics. Biblical interpretation degenerates into a contest of my pre-understanding versus your pre-understanding. That was a, an excerpt from the conclusion of our evangelical hermeneutics book. Present interpretive phenomena among evangelicals are the fruit I'd take out my hearing aid, but I couldn't hear myself if I did that. <laughs> okay. Present interpretive phenomena among evangelicals are the fruit of postmodernism's effect 
on contemporary culture in general and contemporary evangelicalism in particular. To itemize the massive impacts of postmodernism, another name for deconstructionism, on evangelical treatments of Bible prophecy is far beyond the scope of our assignment in this paper. Postmodernism or deconstructionism denies the existence of absolute truth that is discoverable by rational treatment of the content of the Bible. Its impact is so all-encompassing that in the space allotted to us, we can only observe its blurring of distinctions and isolate certain symptoms of the postmodern influence on and beclouding what the Bible actually says about the future. We have th three major sections of our paper. This is the first one, the postmodern blur on the rationality and precision of scripture. This goes into the background somewhat. A leading character is Ernest R. Sandine. In our postmodern climate, the word rationality and precision have come under an attack of the severest sort. The campaign endorsed by a number of evangelicals bears a remarkable similarity to one initiated by E.R. Sandine three or four decades ago. Why such a battle continues to arise is a deep mystery because the foundations laid for discrediting the so-called Scottish common sense realism of the Princeton movement have themselves been so thoroughly discredited. The work of Sandine on fundamentalism has received much attention both from those who buy into his theory partially or totally and from those who have shown the grievous shortcomings of his theory. Sandine contended most 20th century fundamentalists and many 20th century historians have mistakenly assumed that the Protest Protestantism possessed a strong and fully integrated theology of biblical authority, which was attacked by advocates of higher, the higher criticism. As we shall see, no such theology existed before 1950. He developed, excuse me, 1850 that is, he developed a theory that the, that the millenarian, more commonly known today as dispensational premillenarian, literal method of interpretation of scripture was essentially the same as that introduced into evangelicalism through the Princeton doctrine of the scriptures and concluded both Princeton and millen the millenarians have staked their entire conception of Christianity upon a particular view of the Bible based on ultimate 18th century, that is, enlightenment, standards of rationality. In the process of developing this theory, Sandine raised three objections to conclusions of the Princeton theologians. Their doctrine of verbal inspiration, their doctrine of biblical inerrancy, and their view that inspiration applied only to the original autographs. That such doctrines based on rational thought did not exist until the late 19th century has been soundly refuted by a, num a number of times since Sandine published his work in 1970. Woodbridge and Balmer have shown that Sandine's version of the history of biblical authority in the Reformed tradition is misconstrued, that his portrait of the doctrine of biblical authority at 19th century Princeton theological seminary is misleading and that his separation of the Princetonians teaching about the infallibility of the original autographs from the wider context of American and European evangelical thought is erroneous. Contrary to Santine's theory, William Whitaker in 1588 in a 1588 publication and William Ames in 1624, 1627, and 1629 publications, defended a reformed position of biblical inerrancy. 19th century Princetonians did not play a major role in formulating the doctrine of inerrancy in the original autograph, and they did not neglect the role of the Holy Spirit, as Sandine contended. Rather, non-Presbyterian scholars are the ones who exerted major influence in this area. Furthermore, Princetonians such as Charles Hodge did, not, uh, did recognize the role of the Holy Spirit in attesting the authority of Scripture, 
Princeton's position on the inerrancy of the original autographs was not innovative, as Sandine contended, but rather reflected a wider context of Reformed thought and the position of other Christian communions from Augustine to Calvin to Whitaker to Ames. On the basis of so much misinformation in Sandine's work, Woodbridge and Balmer call for a thorough revision of Sandine's work because of the way it has misled so many people. Ronald F. Sata follows a different path in demonstrating the fallacious theory defended by Santin, the theory which included the proposal that the evangelical community in America truly possess no well-defined doctrine of bibliology, including inerrancy, until the later stages of the 19th century. He responds to the three major complaints of Sandine against Charles Hodge and B.B. Warfield, the first of which pertains to verbal inspiration. Sandine held that the doctrine, held the doctrine teaching that the very words were inspired was nascent, but Sata showed, shows the doctrinal, excuse me, shows it conclusively that the doctrine was ancient, extending all the way back to the early fathers. Next, Sata responds to Sandine's contention that the later Princeton scholars altered the emphasis of Charles' theology when they taught that the inspiration of the Bible depended on inerrancy. Here he shows that, contrary to Sandine, Hodge used the term infallible and inerrant interchangeably, meaning that Hodge's successes merely continued the teaching of their mentor. Sandine's third alleged innovation by Princeton Seminary was to focus on the non-extant original autographs so that no one could ever prove the existence of an error in scripture. Sada rep responds to this aspect of Sandine's accusation by five observations. This theory confess, number one, this theory confuses preservation of the text with its inspiration. Number two, Hodge and Warfield would not have appealed to this this phenomenon if it was really new. Number three, this focus on the autographs was vital in th to their defense of scripture. Number four, if this was a calculated dodge by the Princetonians, it would not leave the Bible impregnable, impregnable to attack. And f five, inspiration of the autograph was not new to the reform theology. Sandine concludes this section of his discussion with an interesting statement. Both conservatives and liberals worked at the theological task, but the Princeton professor's insistence that they were doing nothing new while creating a unique apologetic which flew in the face of the standards they were claiming to protect cannot be judged as historically honest or laudable program. Now, this is the classic example of the pot calling the kettle black. If anyone has distorted historical data and cannot be judged as historically honest or laudable, it is Sandine. That is why it is inexplicable that so many contemporary evangelicals for support of their hermeneutical escapades are looking to Sandine's theory about the invention of rationalism through installing Scottish common sense realism at Princeton Seminary in the middle to late 1800s. We now want to look at a number of examples of Sandine's influence, and we call these the Sandinists. <coughs> and here we must uh, summarize and uh, not read the whole text. J.B. Rogers and D.K. McKim, and here I'm, for the sake of our projectionist, we are jumping down to the second paragraph. Rogers and McKim parrot much of the same perspective as Sandine when dealing with Hodge. They portray Hodge as constantly changing his position on matters of inspiration because of opposing scientific theories that arose, theories such as Darwinianism. Their concurrence with Sandine's approach surfaces when they cite his works regarding Archibald Alexander's emphasis on the importance of reason in combating deism. They also cite him extensively, stating that Hodge was wrong when claiming that Princeton theology offered nothing new regarding the doctrine of inspiration that had not been held since the beginning of Christianity. Another example is G.M. Marsden. 
Uh, Marsden has relied heavily on Sandin's work in, in his attempt to define fundamentalism. Basically, he approves of Sandin's historical analysis of late 19th century developments regarding the inspiration of the Bible. Marsden cites Sandin frequently, portraying his work in a positive light, almost exclusively through sometimes, though sometimes differing with him in on lesser points. He concurs with him in allowing the strong influence of common sense philosophy on views of inspiration at Princeton and regarding the role of the, re, of, of the reaction against deism, Darwinianism, and other outgrowths of the Enlightenment as the causes of those views. James Barr is another favorite character of evangelicals these days. He fell victim to Sandine. About the third, fourth line in that paragraph, Regarding the doctrinal stream of fundamentalism, Barr writes, it is a reasonable comment, therefore, to say that fundamentalist conception of truth is dominated by a materialistic view derived from the, a scientific age. This stress on the accuracy of the Bible in its material physical reporting separates modern fundamentalism entirely from the older theology, such as the theology of Luther and Calvin, which it ill-informedly claims as its own forebearer. It is possible to argue further that the chief doctrinal stream accepted by fundamentalism, the Princeton Doctrine of Hodges, Hodge, the Hodges, two of them, and Warfield, took its method expressly from the analogy of natural science and that the natural, that natural science has as seen in the traditional Newtonian mold, he adds, they, conservative evangelicals, have no right to shrug off ram unless they can, are prepared to alter the doctrines of scripture and principles of interpretation upon which ram's reasoning is based and which he is logically following out. Conservative evangelicals have to face the fact that the doctrines of inerrancy and methods of interpretation upon which they insist and they are bound, if they are honest, to come up against exactly these questions. Regarding fundamentalism's view of scripture, Barr opines the fundamentalist position has not been a non-philosophical or anti-philosophical one, but one built on a strong and clear philosophical position in which a very powerful, indeed a practically unlimited role was accorded to reason in the vital matter of biblical interpretation. Mark Knoll, a well-known evangelical historian, contemporary to our day, falls into the same mold. And here we're going to come right down to the end of Knoll's description. The, uh, Knoll's respect for Sandine is reflected in these words. In this modern controversy over the Princetonian conception of the Bible, Sandine, Rogers, and McKim have successfully made the point that a conception of scripture which was thoroughly at home in the intellectual world of the 19th century may not answer every legitimate question in the second half of the 20th. In other words, the setting makes a big difference. Alistair McGrath. Alistair McGrath numbers among those who have bought into Sandine's bogus theory. McGrath confuses secular logic with biblical logic. He also writes, there is a tendency within evangelicalism to treat scripture as simply a source book of Christian doctrines and to overlook, suppress, or deny its narrative character as he speaks disparagingly of deriving propositional truth from scripture. Jumping down a couple of lines, well, I'll read, read. He adds, this, there is a tendency to regard spirituality in terms of understanding this biblical text. That is, to reading it, making sense of its words and ideas, and understanding its historical background and its meaning for today, the emphasis continues to be on reason. Here again, he takes a negative view of the rationality of Scripture when he says we need to purge rationalism from within evangelicalism. And the very end of the paragraph, 
the last sentence. Regarding evangelicalism, he notes it is a travesty of the biblical idea of truth to equate it with the enlightenment notions of conceptual or propositional correspondence or the derived view of evangel evangelism as the proclamation of the propositional correctness of Christian doctrine. Donald Bloch. Though his index shows no citations of Sandine, Donald Bloch is in tune with the temperament of the Sandinist in downflowing rationalism. Scripture, this is his quotation, Scripture is authoritative by virtue of its relation to the living word, not by virtue of its truthfulness as such. This is because its truth is not only understood in relating to Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit and not, not by any rationalistic hermeneutic. He speaks disparagingly of the capacity of reason to judge the truth of revelation. He adds, the knowledge of faith is not an empirical objectifying knowledge, but a knowledge in which we are lifted by above reason and sense into communion with the living God. Historical research can show the historical probability of certain events happening, but it can only give an appro approximate, not final, certainty. The ground of certainty is not what reason can show or prove, but what faith grasps and knows as the human subject acted upon by the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the reading or hearing of the, bib of the biblical word. He continues... In seeking understanding, faith must be on guard against making its cardinal doctrines too clear and distinct, a la Descartes, since this serves to undercut or deny the mystery in Revelation. Among the heresies on the right, he includes dispensationalism and hyperfundamentalism with the explanation, even if the doctrine of sola scriptura understood in the, Reform in the Reformation sense, exists in tension with the current evangelical stress on personal religious experience as well as the fundamentalist appeal to arguments from reason and science in support of total biblical reliability. Bloch is opposed to basing the authority of Scripture on the inerrancy of the writing and then supporting inerrancy with canons of scientific rationality. He denies that the Bible is, fa is fallible or untrustworthy, but wants to limit the Bible's infallibility to matters of faith and practice. John M. Hitchin, who is a uh, former principal of Christian Leaders Training College of Papua New Guinea and the national principal of the Bible College in New, New, New Zealand, the current lecturer in mission at BCNZ, whatever that is, at Pat and at Pathways College of Bible and Mission, Auckland, New Zealand. Why did I bring him in the picture? He's the one that got me started on this search. A recent piece by John M. Hitchens started me on my search for the beginning of evangelical disdain for rationality and precision. In his discussion of what it means to be an evangelical today, Hitchin makes his, takes his cue from John Stott's three evangelical priorities, the revealing initiative of God the Father, the redeeming work of God the Son, and the transforming work of the ministry of the Holy, God the Holy Spirit. In commenting on the authority of God in and through the, in and th through the scriptures, the revealing initiative of God the Father, Hitchin remarks, proper attention to the role of the Holy Spirit in illuminating the scriptures for the believer will move us beyond wooden rationalistic approaches to inspiration and revelation. He cites approvingly the statement of Donald Bosch that disparages right-wing scholastic orthodox re orthodoxy revelation as frozen into a propositional formula. Hitchin continues, by recapturing the relevance of interpreted narratives for our identity and authority as the people of God and by allowing the scriptures themselves to take the place of the discredited assumptions of the Enlightenment worldview as our basis for what is credible and real in the world, that is, our own plausibility structure, we can offer an alternative set of interpretive keys for this otherwise meaningless contempor contemporary society. 
He speaks of moving beyond the concept of truth that assumes that I can define truth once for all in unchangeable propositions, such that anyone who disagrees with my definition must ipso facto be in error. Hitchens' underlying message is that we take advantage of post-modernity's openness to an evangelical alternative by freeing ourselves from the abrasive, dog defensive dogmatism that has characterized the evangelical movement from the past, of the past. As I read these words, I could not help thinking of the widespread revolt, widespread revolt among contemporary evangelical scholars against static biblical inerrancy and its necessary counterpart grammatical historical hermeneutics. Phrases such as moving beyond wooden rationalistic approaches to inspiration and revelation, frozen in propositional formula, recapturing the relevance of interpretive, interpreted narrative, discredited assumptions of the Enlightenment worldview, and moving beyond a concept of truth that assumed that I can define truth once for all in unchangeable propositions, recall the all-out war currently being waged against alleged Princetonian and millenarian teachings that purportedly arose in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, teachings such as a rational approach to scripture through following scientific principles of interpretation and a clear-cut standard on biblical inerrancy such as is in tune with the 1978 Chicago Statement of the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. Now our response to the Sandinist, Sandinist and Sandin and his followers seem to raise at least four issues regarding developments at Princeton and dispensational premillennialism at the end of the, end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Number one is the alleged overaction of Princeton scholars and the dispensationalist in response to modernism that was arising in the various forms at, th at the time. They paint the picture of a group who went, into an un went to an unneeded extreme in order to refute abuses of biblical teaching through an undue attention to science rather than scripture. Next paragraph. What the Sandinists fail to recognize is that all, or at least almost all, advancement in orthodox doctrine throughout the centuries of Christianity has been in response to heresy. To codify a, the doctrine of inspiration more specifically was completely in line with church history. The Princetonians and the Millennialists sought to correct errors imposed by the Enlightenment, such is a credit to them rather than a fault. Number two, Sandine and his company were also critical of principles of literal interpretation, characterizing it by such expressions as a wooden mechanistic discipline. What else could the scientific principles of interpretation and the literal interpretation that Sandine refers to be but grammatical historical hermeneutics as espoused by the Princeton scholars? Sandine felt that such principles were too restrictive to allow for mysteries of the leading of the Holy Spirit in biblical interpretation. In keeping with the postmodern spirit of not limiting interpretation to a, of a single passage to one meaning, Sandine felt that such as the principle of a single meaning would to be an innovation of late 19th century scholarship and not the traditional Christian view. His view was eventually deemed to be inconsistent with, inconsistent with biblical inerrancy as attested by the founding of the 1978 Council, which vouched for grammatical historical principles as inseparable from inerrancy. That evaluation befits Santine's intentions, one of which was to disprove the biblical inerrancy espoused by the millenarians and the Princeton scholars. Number three. In arguing against principles of grammatical historical hermeneutics, Sandin, Sandinists rejected the principle of single meaning along the same lines that rejected modernism, it re that rejected modernism and embraced postmodernism. In that spirit, Henshin writes, proper attention to the role of the Holy Spirit in illuminating the scriptures for the believer will move beyond wooden rationalistic approaches to inspiration and revelation. 
This means moving beyond a concept of truth that assumes that I can define truth once for all in unchangeable propositions such that anyone who disagrees with my definition must ipso facto be in error. Postmodernity gives us as much right as anyone openly to present gospel alternatives for national, societal, societal family, and personal livings. And uh, to embrace postmodernism is to dismiss all possibilities of defining propositional truth from Scripture because truth cannot be limited to what is defined by grammatical historical principles. Sandinus never acknowledged that the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit is discernible only in light of what the scriptures teach when rightly interpreted by rational principles. The impossibility of obtaining propositional truth is associated with the claim that common sense position is an outgrowth of the Enlightenment worldview. Such a claim flows from an assumption that both modernism stemming from the Enlightenment and fundamentalism build on the principle of being able to define truth once for all in unchangeable propositions. The difference between both of these and postmodernism is that postmodernism disallows that, prop that propositional stance. That comparison of modernism and fundamentalism is, of course, ridiculous in contrast, in contrast to fundamentalism, modernism proposition built upon a very loose doctrine of biblical inspiration which allowed all sorts of opportunities to question the integrity of the text. Fundamentalism, on the other hand, held a high view of scripture that required literal interpretation of the text. One can hardly say with a straight face that common sense approach is an outgrowth of an Enlightenment worldview. I'll just... Uh, since Sandine's approach leads inevitably to a more subjective approach to interpretation rather than a grammatical historical one, it encourages a looser view of narrative portions of scripture. And we have a description that Sandine has of that. And in following his quotation, this premise allows contemporary Christians to read their own situations into the text at will with no restrictions placed on the text meaning by authorial human and divine intention. Number four, a fourth issue raised by Sandinism relates to how the Holy Spirit is involved in interpretation of the text. How can a person know whether he is being led to a certain conclusion by a spirit of error rather than by the Holy Spirit? He can know only through what the Bible teaches. He can only know what the Bible teaches only through rational principles of hermeneutics. And... Uh, so it goes without saying that uh, the Sandinists fall to the ground once again. Now let's look at, at the next section, the Princeton theologians. The heavy focus in this debate on the Princeton theologians warrants a closer look at their weaknesses and strengths, the strengths of these men, and we will talk about their weaknesses first of all. And we agree with the Sandinists on this point. Sandinists have faulted the Princeton theologians for concessions they made to the Enlightenment. One of these concessions was their attempt to integrate the Bible with findings of secular science and uh, such as Darwinianism. In this, the Sandinists furnish a valid criticism. As Noel points out, Warf B. B. Warfield, and we're skipping the quotation there, was a, uh, bought into the... Uh, theistic evolution as did Charles Hodge and uh, we would confer with them down to the last section in that section science cannot be used to correct grammatical historical principles that was a weakness of the Princetonians their strengths where critics of the Princetonians theologians Princeton theologians stray from the truth however lies in their insistence that biblical inerrancy is limited Inerrancy is limited to matters of faith and practice. And uh, the Princetonians would not buy into that. The next paragraph. As far back as the second century AD, the church father Irenaeus used common sense to define truthfulness of Luke's reporting with the words, it follows then as of course 
that these men must either receive the test, the rest of the narrative, or else reject these parts also, for no person of common sense can permit them to receive some things recounted by Luke as being truth and to set aside others if he, as if he had known the truth. Irenaeus, of course, came long before a Cartesian approach to reason existed. The fact that Hodge himself rejected a purely Cartesian approach by, to rationality when he cited Romans 1, 21 to 30, 23, to show that human reason and conscience are inadequate guides in relationship to the things of God. Descartes would never have endorsed such a position as that. Woodbridge surveys the entire Christian era before Princeton to show that Christians used common sense to defend the inerrancy of Scripture. Along with their assertions as to the reasonableness of Scripture, the Princeton theologians insisted on the precision of Scripture, and we will not uh, have time to talk about that. Coming down to the next section, the truth about rationality and precision. First of all, what the truth is not. Rationality and precision go hand in hand with Scripture and with the inerrancy of Scripture. Sacrifice rationalistic and precise understanding of the Bible and you have opted for an errantist understanding of the Bible. Yet surprisingly, the lead article in a recent journal of the Inerrantist Evangelical Theological Society raises some of the same issues as do the Sandinist. In the article, Joel Green reflects a disdain for a number of the same objects as critics of the Princeton theology. And four examples of this similarity will suffice. Green shows that the same proclivity to emphasize the narrative portions of scripture and how these should shape the lives of Christians when he writes, the bulk of scripture comes to us in the form of narratives rather than with a preoccupation with the rational essence of the faith, its dogmatic essentials, essentials so characteristic of theology in the modern period. Uh, next paragraph, please. Green also shows the same disdain for rationalistic approaches to revelation. And uh, without reading that whole paragraph, we'll leave that to your initiative. The next paragraph, like the Sandinist, Green also reflects a disdain for deriving propositional truth from scripture. This means that the primary agenda of theological study of scripture would not be the construction of systematic theology in the restricted sense of organizing and restating the central propositions of the biblical witnesses, such as a position very much like that of Hitchin when he speaks of moving beyond a concept of truth that assumes that I can define truth once for all in unchangeable propositions. And then Green also moves away from supporting the precise precision of the narrative portion of scripture when he writes about the inadequacy of foundationalism. And because our time is running so fast, we are going to go down to the next section without reading Green's next quotation. What the truth is. Given its rightful place of priority, the divine element the inspiration of scripture guarantees both its rationality and its precision because, of our, because our God is both rational and precise. Some of my earlier words about the rationality and precision of scripture clarify the difference between secular logic and biblical logic. And here we have an extended quotation from yours truly, which we don't have time to read. And uh, we are going to move way a couple of pages over down to the end of this first section. I don't know, I'm on page 19. I don't know whether that means anything to you or not, but uh, without question, the Bible itself insists on the ultimate in precision for its contents because its author is a God of precision. Therefore, the truth about truth is that bo it is both rational and precise. The myth that those conclusions resulted from the Princetonians' adoption of Enlightenment thinking is merely a smokescreen 
for those whose inclinations is to veer away from the inerrancy of scripture. That so many evangelicals who profess to be inerrantists are buying into Sandinist principles is sad. Principles that are con inconsistent with biblical inerrancy and have no place on an inerrantist agenda. When questioning the inerrancy of scripture, one undercates the biblical teaching about the future. Now our next major section, the postmodern blur generating middle ground mania. Another symptom of postmodernism's influ post influence on evangelical hermeneutics is what could be called middle ground mania. The interpretive atmosphere of today appears to impose an insatiable appetite for theologians to have the best of two worlds, to locate themselves between established positions, thereby mixing literal and non-literal hermeneutical principles. Another adjustment. It would help. I'll take out that hearing aid then. That's all right. You're doing great. I, I don't particularly want to listen to myself anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I generally go to sleep when I'm listening to myself. <laughs> no, I listened to a sermon I did one time and fell asleep, and I found five things I disagreed with me on. Okay. <laughs> okay. And they locate themselves, locate themselves between established positions, thereby mixing literal and non-literal hermeneutical principles in various combinations. John Piper provides an example of this by classifying himself in three theological camps, dispensationalism, covenant theology, and new covenant theology. This came from his website. John Piper has something in common with each of these three views, but does not classify himself within any of these three camps. He is probably the furthest away from dispensationalism, although he does agree with dispensationalism that there will be a millennium. Many of his theological heroes have been covenant theologians, for example, many of the Puritans, and he does, not, he, he does seem see some merit in the concept of a pre-fall work of covenant of works, pre-fall covenant of works, but he has not taken a position on their specific conception of the covenant of grace. In regards to his views on the Mosaic law, he seems closer to, the, to new covenant theology than covenant theology, although once again it would not work to say that he, is preci he precisely falls within that category. Postmodernism sees merit in contradictory systems to the point that a person positions himself in either a none of the above or an all of the above category, as has Piper. For a time, progressive dispensationalism was alone in seeking a compromise between covenant theology and dispensationalism. Now at least three theological camps are vying for a position in the hermeneutical gap that separates the two systems. All of this comes because of the middle ground mania that postmodernism has generated. Further, it all comes through the sacrifice of consistent grammatical, historical, hermeneutical principles. To illustrate the inconsistency, all one needs to do is to trace how the competing systems treat the land promises, promise given to Abraham as part of the Abrahamic covenant. Without question, God promised Abraham a specific plot of land on the earth as is currently known, a land that was populated by numerous, rumors, numerous people groups. We won't reread the scriptures for you. This, this uh, audience knows the scriptures. The last line in the paragraph, the territory thus designated has an estimated size of 300,000 square miles or 12 and a half times the size of Great Britain and Ireland. Through the un unilateral covenant, God obligated himself, no one else, to give the land to Abraham, later confirming it as a perpetual inheritance through circumcision in Genesis 17, 7 to 11. Now we're coming down to the next paragraph. Various theological systems have explained these, those land promises differently, but one has impacted public opinion more profoundly than the others in creating sympathy in America and elsewhere for Israel and her right to have sovereign control over the land or a portion thereof promised to Abraham. The following discussion will sample and will change that five to three systems to see how they interpret the land promises. 
covenant theology. Well, the three will be new covenant theology, kingdom theology, progressive dispensationalism. We're assuming a familiarity with covenant theology and dispensationalism. So we're skipping the section on covenant theology and moving over to the section on new covenant theology. New covenant theology handles the land promises to Abraham differently. That position starts by affirming that the promises were fulfilled when Israel under Joshua's leadership conquered Canaan. Michael W. Adams quotes the Old Testament book of Joshua on this point. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their fathers and they took possession of it and settled there. Next uh, paragraph, from this passage he surmises, it seems quite clear that Joshua 21, from Joshua 21, that under Joshua's leadership, the nation Israel experienced rest from oppression on every one of, on every one of their borders. We do not know how long this rest lasted, but the Joshua passage makes it very clear to us that they did rest. Adams acknowledges that the rest did not last. And then cites Hebrews 4, verses 8 and 9, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He points out that the only way to avoid a contradiction between the two passages is to see the author of Hebrews as viewing the physical picture of Israel in the land as finding its true fulfillment in salvation resulting in heaven for every believer. In other words, the land promises to Israel are a physical picture of a spiritual truth that would never have been known from the Old Testament alone. The New Testament gives completely new information on the subject. And here we have John Riesinger doing uh, it's pretty much the same thing using different scriptures. Um, his position is, and we've, we're junking several quotations and paragraphs, his position is, I believe the dispensationalist is wrong in not seeing that the New Testament scriptures spiritualize the land promise, but the answer is not to deny what the Old Testament scriptures clearly say. His interest in the next paragraph, skip a paragraph, his interesting proposal raises questions. To what land was Jesus referring when he spoke of the future repentance of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the New Covenant theology says the land promises are never repeated in the New Testament, that they are revoked. But then uh, we have, in the next two lengthy paragraphs, we have pointed out certain features of the land that are mentioned in the New Testament, and presumably as a part of the promise, uh, the land promises to Israel. His, to, the, to what land was Jesus referring when he spoke of the future repentance of the city of Jerusalem? And that is uh, just one example in various parts of the New Testament, in Revelation, as, and as well as elsewhere. Now we're down to the paragraph which begins with Riesinger's claim that no land promise occurs in the New Testament falls short by not recognizing that the land promise is assumed in the New Testament. He also falters in positing that the New Testament contradicts the consistent teaching of the Old Testament in regard to the land promise to Abraham. Such an approach raises questions about the inerrancy of scripture that is an, an inevitable part of grammatical historical interpretation. Next paragraph, New Covenant Theology forfeits its credibility by failing to do justice to God's faithfulness to his promise of giving Abraham the land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates. Then the next section is kingdom theology. Kingdom theology. Kingdom theology lays heavy emphasis on the centrality of the kingdom in the Bible. Russell D. Moore represents the cause of kingdom theology and places the blame for the failure of evangelicals in the socio-political arena on an inadequate evangelical theology of the kingdom. The failure of evangelical politics points us to something far more important that underlies it, the failure of evangelical theology. The position that places heavy emphasis on the work of Carl F. H. Henry 
particularly the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism. As seen by Russell D. Moore, Henry was a leader in the new evangelical movement right after World War II that sought to cure evangelicalism of its fundamentalistic isolation from the activity of contemporary society and politics. The next lengthy quote mentions Henry's name, mentioned Ram, Carnell, the Fuller Seminary, the National Association of Evangelicals, and uh, point out how these were a reaction after World War II to the isolation of fundamentalism in general and dispensationalism in particular. The next paragraph, in addition, Moore continues, evangelicalism was divided into two camps, the covenantalists and the dispensationalists with their differing view of the kingdom, a division that hindered evangelicalism from having a united impact on the secular world. Henry considered the debates between premillennialists and amillennialists that divided evangelicalism as secondary issue, issues. As Moore puts it, Henry's uneasy conscience waded into the kingdom debate as an incipient call for a new consensus, one that was to break from the kingdom concept of classical dispensationism and also from the spiritual understanding of many covenantal theologians. Henry was joined in this by the exegetical and biblical and theological synthesis of George Eldon Ladd, who went even further in calling for a new evangelical vision of the kingdom, usually riling both dispensational premillennialists and covenant amillennialists in the process. In Moore's estimation, the consensus for which Henry pled has begun to emerge. Remarkably, the move toward a consensus of kingdom theology has come most markedly not from the broad center of evangel the evangelical coalition as represented by Henry or Ladd, but from the rival streams of dispensationalism and covenant theology themselves. Progressive dispensationalists led by theologians such as Craig Blazing, Darrell Bach, and Robert Sosey have set forth a counterproposal to almost the entire spectrum of traditional dispensational thought. With much less fanfare, but with equal significance, a group of covenant theologians led by scholars such as Anthony Holcomb, Vern Poitras, Edmund Clowney, and Richard Gaffin have also proposed significant doctrinal development within their tradition. In the absence of an adequate theology of the kingdom, Moore sees promising signs of an emerging consensus that would replace King, would, would place, that would place kingdom theology as a central focus of evangelicalism. And here we're going to have to skip several paragraphs again. I want to get to the last section before our time is up. And uh, we do have a, a little bit more time. Uh, after the quotation which begins uh, until this point, we have this comment. Moore criticizes dispensationalists for giving Israel a major role in the future millennium. Dispensationalists, even progressives, mistakenly speak of the millennial Israel as having a mediatorial role in dispensing the blessings of God to the nations. The identification of Jesus with Israel as her king, her substitute, and her goal is everywhere throughout the apostolic understanding of the Old Testament promise. He criticizes covenantalists for their use of replacement theology. As with the doctrine of salvation, this tension is resolved not by arguing for a replacement of a Jewish nation with a largely Gentile church, but by centering on the head-body relationship between the church and Jesus, the true Israelite. Nevertheless, he still has no place for the kingdom pro program, no place in the kingdom program for a special role for a national Israel. Moore dispro disapproves of interpreting Abraham's land promises as referring to the spiritual blessings of forgiveness of the sins of an eternal life. He prefers rather to side with Justin Marta, who saw all the promises of Israel, both material and spiritual, as belonging to Jesus, the, Israel, the, the Israelite, and therefore by legal inheritance to those who are united to him. The next paragraph. From the above survey, the 
Kingdom theology has no place for referring Abraham's land promises to the plot of ground on the surface of the present earth is evident. Moore's case built on the new evangelicalism that arose after World War II is extremely interesting, but, it, but its use of scripture is careless. It is another example of hopscotch exegesis, hopping from one text to another, never taking time to investigate the contextual meaning of each verse cited. His case is primarily lacking in its failure to examine the Gospels carefully, to delineate in detail the different ways that Jesus spoke of the kingdom during his time on earth. Progressive dispensationalism. The similarity of progressive dispensationalism and the covenant premillennialism of George Ladd has frequently been noted, yet Nichols sees the premillennial progressive dispensationalist far more Israelitish than Ladd. In investigating the land promise of Abraham, one must ask how much more Israelitish than covenant premillennialism. And we have questions about that. Uh, we look more specifically at what have they done with Israel's land promise. And apparently Craig Blazing and Daryl Bach merged Gentiles with Israel in Israel's future inheritance. We can illustrate this progressive dispensational view of the church in the case of Jewish Christians. A Jew who becomes a Christian today does not lose his or her relationship to Israel's future promises. Jewish Christians will join the Old Testament remnant of faith in the inheritance of Israel. Gentile Christians will be joined by saved Gentiles of earlier dispensations. Altogether, Jews and Gentiles will share the same blessings of the Spirit as testified to by the relationship of Jew and Gentile in the church of this dispensation. The result will be that all peoples will be reconciled in peace, their ethnic and national differences being no cause for hostility. Earlier forms of dispensationalism for all their emphasis on the future of Israel excluded Jewish Christians from that future, postulating that the church is a different people group from Israel and the church. And its emphasis on one, only one people of God, progressive dispensationalism must make everyone, including Gentiles in the church and saved Gentiles from other dispensations, inheritance of Israel's promises. And that does not make for a very Israelitish millennium. It rather merges everyone into the inheritance promise to Israel or else it denies Israel what God has promised her. We'll skip uh, Porth, this, this quote, quotation by Porthris and go to the next one. At this juncture, it appears that progressive dispensationalism agrees with covenant theology. And uh, from that quotation that we didn't cite, Poitras continues, let us be more specific about the implications. Theoretically, one might imagine situations where in the future kingdom, Jewish Christians live predominantly in the land of Palestine, whereas Christians, Gentile Christians live predominantly elsewhere. Such geographical Distinctiveness does not in and of itself create a problem. However, dispensationalists want to find a particular religious significance in one special land, the land of Palestine, as distinct from other lands. Canaan undoubtedly had such significance in the Old Testament period because I would argue it typified the inheritance of the world in Christ. Apparently, progressive dispensationalism falls into the same position as covenant theology on this issue. Next paragraph, covenant theology has no place for Israel's inheritance of inheriting the land that God promised to Abraham. Neither does progressive, dis neither does progressive dispensationalism. The response of progressive dispensationalism to the land promise issue is either silence or a mixture. The next paragraph, Robert Sosi discusses the land promise extensively as part of the Abrahamic covenant, but is inconsistent with his application of it. He expands the seed promise to Abraham to include all those in union with Christ. Then he ties the land promise to the seed promise as a need, land needing occupants. From that point, he develops extensively the position that the land promise must refer to the geographical territory originally promised to Abraham. 
In concluding his discussion of the land, he writes, thus the land aspect of the Abrahamic promise retains validity in the New Testament. There is no evidence that the promise of the land has been either completely fulfilled historically or reinterpreted to mean a symbol of heaven or the blessing of spiritual life in general. Yet then he goes on to say, the spiritual position of being in Christ in no way canceled out the reality of a real material universe, which is also the inheritance of the believer in Christ. What is the land then? Is it what God promised to Abraham, or is it the whole earth? Who are the seed of Abraham who will inherit the land? Abraham's physical descendants or all who are in Christ. At best, progressive dispensationalism sends a mixed message regarding the land promised to Abraham. At worst, it denies the fulfillment of that promise altogether. And since everyone knows the position of dispensationalism, we will skip most of this section. Um, in fact, I think we had better skip it all so we do get to the last section of the paper. It'll give you something to do when you get home to read the rest of it. Postmodern blur of propositional prophecy. Postmodernism has cast its spell on propositional truth in biblical prophecy in at least two ways. It has raised questions, number one, about whether anyone can confidently affirm special teachings about the future, and number two, about maintaining a distinction between dispensational and covenant teachings, covenantal teachings regarding the millennium. The first section, tentativeness versus certainty. In a widely circulated volume on evangelical hermeneutics, the authors furnish an illustration and then apply it to the interpretation of biblical prophecy. And this is the volume by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard, published by Word, Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics. Stephen Travis offered a helpful human illustration of this point. That is, that the Old Testament promise of land to Abraham takes on a new, on new meaning. Instead of, land of the land of earthly Palestine, a better country, a heavenly one. He compares God to a loving parent who knows his children's expectations, delights in outdoing them. A little girl may expect a doll for Christmas, but the doll she receives, one that walks, talks, weeps, and wets, far exceeds her expectations. She gets what she wanted, a new doll. So continuity connects her expectations with their fulfillment. She does not feel deceived by the difference be between them, but happily surprised. Likewise, God's fulfillment of some prophecies may exceed the expectations his people have of them. For readers today, this illustration illust indicates that we should resist the popular tendency to interpret prophecy as if it were a written script of what God was obligated to follow. God's purposes certainly do not change, and we may expect him to adhere to much of the prophetic design. But as he has in the past, he may ad-lib along some unexpected lines. Hence, as we said earlier, Bible students should interpret prophecy tentatively rather than dogmatically. Our God is a God of surprises, and he may still have some left. Stated in another way, we cannot be sure about the Bible's teaching regarding the future. Postmodernism encourages a tentative handling of biblical prophecy. In commenting on various views on eschatology, Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard write, perhaps one is or more parties are creatively interpreting the text. This does not deny the above possibilities, but rather may legitimize the view that several options are not only possible, but also valid in such interpretive statements, stalemates rather. They continue, all millennialists and premillennialist Christians need to get and embrace each other and their postmillennial fellow believers. One may say, I don't agree with your conclusions, but in light of who you are and your community of faith, in light of how those, 
these biblical texts have been interpreted throughout history and in light of the diligence and care with which you attempt to understand and live in conformity with the Bible's teachings, I concede your interpretation. You have responded to the Bible in a valid manner. Here is a classic example of postmodernism. As it were, your conclusion contradicts mine, but both conclusions are valid. <laughs> we both can set our own criteria for what truth is, and we both are right. Absolute truth is not a reality because its standards must be set by each individual. In other words, it is not absolute. I suggest that confidence rather than tentative is, tentativeness is justified and even necessary in regard to biblical truths. In making two simple requests regarding the historical reliability of the synoptic gospels, I have encountered severe criticism from the camp of evangelical historical criticism. My first request was, please name an evangelical historical critic who has done extensive work in the synoptic gospels who has not, as a result of that methodology, sacrificed historical accuracy at one point or another. Rather than naming a person as requested, a responder raised the question of what does historical accuracy mean? <laughs> I ask, is there more than one definition of historical accuracy? Grammatical interpretation says no, but postmodernism says yes. My second request was, tell us to which evangelical we should look as a final authority on what, the synoptic gospel, what in the synoptic gospels is historical and what is not. That contemporary evangelical scholars do not agree among themselves about the historicity of various parts of the gospels is conspicuously evident. Instead of naming one whose work could be viewed as authority, the responder accused me of assuming the role of final authority. Apparently, because I look upon historical facts in the Gospels as a fixed entity, something one can view as absolutely true. Even though he professes to view the Bible as inerrant, my responder has apparently drunk deeply of the waters of postmodernism. For him, historical facts as recorded in the Gospels are not fixed, and we need not speak of them as though they were. My responder even proceeded to imply that I was not exemplifying a hermeneutic of humility. <laughs> and we have this all documented. I hope it's on the CD. This has been in print, by the way. For the postmodernist, everything is tentative. If one dares to express certainty in interpreting scripture, he is not practicing a hermeneutic of humility and is manifesting pride according to postmodernism. I suggest that a trust in the inerrancy of Scripture is a matter of conviction, not pride. Amen. If one cannot be sure about the meaning of plain statements of Scripture, what is less to be sure about? In recent times, evangelicals have spilt much ink in discussing and practicing a hermeneutic of humility. In introducing his commentary on Revelation, Osborne writes, thus in interpreting symbols of the book, we must First, we first need the hermeneutics of humility to realize that we see things imperfectly as in a poor mirror. We are to center on the purpose of the text and note that the theological thrust, and note the theological thrust leaving what will actually happen with God. According to Osborne, we should not try to tie the symbols of the apocalypse to modern events. To do so would be too specific, too dogmatic, we must be satisfied to remain tentative in interpreting the book. Van Hooser adds to the postmodern chorus, deconstruction together with the varieties of hermeneutic suspicion performs a valuable service in checking interpretive pride. I really readily grant this point, yet I have also argued that the humiliation of meaning and interpretation that results from this undoing is not the same as interpretive humility. Humility, I have suggested, is a specific Christian contribution to hermeneutics. He continues, the postmodern crisis in interpretation is actually a legitimate crisis. Whose voice, which interpretation, what aim, and why? What aim counts, and why? 
Van Hooser goes on to contrast a hermeneutic of the cross and a hermeneutics of glory and says those who read according to the hermeneutics of glory revel in their own interpretive skills, impose their interpretive theories on the text, and eclipse the text's own meaning. Van Hooser displays his infection with the postmodern virus in his words about eschatology. He writes, eschatology puts into question a fundamentalist epistemology that aspires to absolute truths and objective certainties. Speaking of the task of interpreting the written word, he says, there is an eschatological tension that must not be ignored, a tension that prohibits us from thinking that the truth, the single correct interpretation, is our present possession. He describes another way in which eschatology raises questions about fundamentalist interpretation. The fundamentalist ten tendency to re resist figural interpretation and the fundamentalist insist that the passages about Israel concern the physical nation, Israel, and never the church. Specifically, he opines the hermeneutics of dispensationalism is insufficiently sensitive, I believe, to the literary sense of the text, in this case to the literary genres of prophecy and apocalyptic. As far as Van Hooser is concerned, what, in, what the Bible says about the future must remain an open question. Tying his view on eschatology in with his words about hermeneutical humility, this scholar concludes, here I only add that one should pursue the quest for the single correct interpretation of the, under the ages of hope and its reminder, not yet, that the meaning and significance of the text are never a present position, possession but a partially fulfilled promise is perhaps sufficient antidote to the poison of prideful interpretation. Van Hooser's strong words about the poison of private and prideful, prideful interpretation make ludicrous his accompanying discussion about hermeneutics of conviction, which sees that while absolute knowledge is not a present possession, adequate knowledge is. One wonders how a person can have strong convictions about the meaning of a biblical pa passage that is not in his present possession. Postmodernism's effect on biblical hermeneutics has been to render the Bible's teaching on prophecy at best as tentative, at worst as non-existent. As I've noticed elsewhere, it goes hand in hand with the modern linguistics proclivity to render the Bible's meaning as unattainable because of the frailties of human understanding. And then the final section of this final section, premillennialism versus premillennialism. One of the spells cast by postmodernism as educated people believing, has educated people believing that they can assign their own definitions to classical, defined, classically defined terminology. In the general realm of interpretation, I've commented on this before and I have that documented. But a recent example relates specifically to Bible prophecy. Several years ago, I asked a well-known evangelical scholar whose reputation as an amillennialist was widespread about his recent change to join the faculty of an evangelical seminary whose statement of faith required its faculty to hold a premillennial position. In response to my question about how he could teach at a premillennial institution, he replied, it depends on how you define the millennium. In more recent study, I have learned that how generally prevalent among evangelicals is the practice of making no distinction between the millennium and the eternal state. Covenant theologians are merging the two together so that they now call themselves premillennialists. Furthermore, progressive dispensations have joined them in merging the millennium with the eternal state as one final dispensation. Moore sings the praises of both groups for bringing about a consensus to support his kingdom theology position. Rather than distinguishing between the millennium and the eternal state for the sake of simplicity and flexibility, Blazing and Bach combine the two into one dispensation that they call the Zionic dispensation. Similarly, Poitras, a covenantal theologian, summarizes the covenantal position. Now what about the millennium? What are we to expect in the future? In principle, this fuller consummation of all things described in Revelation 21.1 through 22.5, or in a silver age, commonly called a millennium, distinct from both the consummation and from the present time, 
The language of Revelation 21 through 1 through 22, 5 indicates that the, the consummate, con consummation will be the greatest fulfillment of the bulk of Old Testament prophecy. The emphasis on the new earth helps to bring about the traditional millennial position, helps to bring about tradi the traditional millennial positions close to one another. If all are able to agree that the new earth represents the most intensive fulfillment, argues about fulfillments of a lesser scope will seem to be less crucial. Noting the similarity between the progressive dispensational and covenantal positions regarding the millennium and the eternal state, Poitras comments further. In fact, some modified dispensationalists agree that the points made in the whole, this, the whole of this chapter, so provided we are able to treat the question of Israel's relative distinctiveness in the millennium as a minor problem, no substantial areas of disagreement remain. The cozy agreement between progressive dispensationalism and recent covenantal positions in merging the millennium and the eternal state has a marked deficiency. It ignores the biblical text of Revelation 19.11 through 21.5. In particular, two elements of the text prevent a merging of the two eras. First, the last eight scenes of the passage, each introduced by Kai, Adon, and I saw, are chronologically successive, a factor necessitating that the eighth scene, 21, 1 to 5, and the fifth scene, 20 verses 4 to 10, are distinct from each other. And uh, I've pointed out what these eight scenes are in the next paragraph. Next paragraph after that, the return of Christ, scene number one, must happen first or else the invitation to the birds of prey, number two, is pointless. The invitation to the birds, number two, must occur before the defeat of the beast in order for the birds to be present for the, when the slaughter occurs, 1921b. The binding of Satan, number four, must transpire before the millennium and his release at the end, number five, to account for his inactivity during the millennium. All, of the all the first five scenes must take place before the appearance of the great white throne, number six, because they relate to the old earth and, the, and heaven, which depart when the throne appears. The great white throne, number six, must be in place before it can be a scene for judging those absent from the book of life. The judgment of the lost, and number seven, must come before the new heaven and the new earth to explain the absence of all evil from the new creation. More broadly, the speaking the second coming of Christ, number one, is clearly the earliest of the series in its fulfillment with the new creation coming last, number eight. The millennium and its associated events, four and five, are obviously antecedent to the events of the great white throne because they pertain to the present creation. In his interesting exposition of Revelation 19, 1 through 22, 21, 5, McLeod concurs in general with the chronological sequence of the scenes though he divides these scenes a little differently. The chronological sequence and fulfillment of these scenes is obvious to most, but a covenantalist such as Porthos would probably reply that such an approach is too rational to be probable. After all, he objects to dispensationalists, dispensationalism's scientifically precise language in relation to the existence of unconditional covenants between God and Israel, Covenantalists live in a world of generalities and shun specifics regarding biblical prophecy. For them, therefore, the arrival of postmodernism's blurring of clear statements in the Bible is a welcome addition. Such a cultural climate gives them more ammunition in the battle, their battle against dispensationalism. Second, fulfillment of most Old Testament prophecies regarding the future must transpire in the earth as presently known. They cannot be filled in, filled in the new heaven and the new earth because the present earth will no longer exist. Poesis is mistaken when he writes the language of Revelation 21, 1 through 22, 5 indicates that the consummation will be the greatest fulfillment of the book of Old Testament prophecy. With only a few exceptions, Old Testament prophecy about matters yet future pertains to the present order of creation, an order that will be non-existent upon the arrival of the new creation. Though some see only a renovation of the present earth, the same observation must hold. The earth will be different from the one that is previously known, envisioned in Old Testament prophecy. 
The clear biblical distinction between the millennial period and the new heaven and the new earth is decisive, and any attempts to merge the two into a newly defined premillennialism are anti-biblical and must be ruled as misleading and deceptive, another result of postmodern hermeneutics. And finally, the muddied state of postmodern biblical studies. We have surveyed how every person is doing right in his or her own eyes in the postmodern world of evangelical hermeneutics. In sampling recent criticisms of the Princeton scholars and 19th century dispensationalism, we saw the postmodern blurring of the rationality and precision of scripture. We then took a look at how postmodern, the, a, the postmodern blur is generating a middle ground mania among evangelicals. Next, we took two samples of how postmodernism has sought to obliterate propositional truth in the realm of Bible prophecy. In our postmodern culture, evangelicals may still call their hermeneutics by the familiar grammatical historical terminology, but they have endowed familiar expression, the familiar expression with an entirely different meaning. In the eyes of today's world, such a gathering as the pre-trib study group is a textbook example of the poison of prideful interpretation because it bases its existence on the certainties of what the Bible says about the future. Amen. But in the eyes of God, the God of the Bible, this, this gathering is a dose of health-giving vitamins for today's ch Church of Jesus Christ. May God bless this organization in the fulfillment of its mission of spreading the truth of the imminent return of Christ and the end time events to follow. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. We still have seven minutes for questions. Uh, who'll be the first? It sounds like things are in a mess, aren't they? I mean, you know, are they reading the same Bible? No. Well, yeah. Okay, who's got a question? Or, okay, good. some of appeal to Warfield and his inductive approach going to the evidence of Christ's resurrection of miracles and then working from that perspective. Uh, do you see anything of, of a concern in that? And is that, uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I think there's validity in going both ways. Okay. I, I would not want to rule out either one. I think that uh, it, ultimately it goes back to your view of God. Who is God? What kind of God do we have? Is he a, a rational God, a God of precision, or not? If he is a God of precision, and if you precision, and if you will allow that the divine element and in inspiration overrules the human element and in inspiration, then that that should be enough. But uh, then you can go you can go to these other arguments to bolster that. I think. It's not a problem with verbal plenary inspiration. Mm, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So we, we see a lot of the quotations and people that he's referring to in this lecture come out of evangelical scholarship. And so what this shows is the trend and direction of evangelical scholarship, you know, is leading back down. Uh, to liberalism, a and I think we'll have another paper or two that will document some of the specificity, you know, of this, and that's why they're not open to uh, literal Bible prophecy. And uh, I think the Bible calls that apostasy or something like that. I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to be too... Uh, you, can, you can coin your own terms. Give it as your own definition now. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what... But would I be practicing the hermeneutics of humility? I guess I can only suggest, suggest that it could be apostasy uh, and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things I notice is, is they've, they've shifted uh, your theological conclusions now are all hermeneutics. Absolutely. Instead of hermeneutics being a method, hermeneutics is a the theological position. So the basic issue. Yes. Uh, Dr. Thomas, yes. Uh, 
I'm running this into some guys, especially UPS and other places that deal with this common sense, uh, Scottish common sense as a means of knocking down, uh, in, well, inspiration and other things that involve it. What books would you uh, suggest that would be helpful in critiquing this type of usage of going against the Princeton theologians uh, in that way? Well, um, the ones that respond to, to Stanley Grins and others, I think the, uh, the book by, by uh, Woodbridge and Smallson would, would be one of the best there. And then this other was just a journal, journal article that I cited. But uh, they, I think they, they have done a good job of knocking uh, Sandine in the head, really. Yeah, what they do is they just say that uh, Scottish common sense rationalism, in other words, a human philosophical system, is responsible for the interpretive paradigm of dispensationalism or inerrancy, you know, or even uh, Princetonian Calvinism, for example. Uh, and, they, and in their circles, that's enough to dismiss it, exactly. They just dismiss it without uh, examining the arguments. It would seem to me that, to some extent, we can show that, as you did in your paper, that uh, a lot of these arguments preceded uh, Princeton, and also, uh, you know, that 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 just because there was a school of uh, Scottish common sense rationalism doesn't mean that every person alive on in the Western world uh, partook of that at that time. It goes all the way back. Common sense goes all the way back to the ancient church. So. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you, Dr. Thomas. We appreciate your uh, wonderful paper. Uh, before people are dismissed, uh, we got some instructions here. You're supposed to be back at uh, 150. Also, does everybody know that the the disc in the packet has the papers on it? Does anybody not know that? Okay, the CD has the papers on it. We're in doubt about whether it has the footnotes. It does. It, it does, yes. And also, if there are any upgrades or updates on people's papers, we will put them on the website after the conference within a couple of weeks.